Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Nick Zulovich, part of the team at Cherokee Media Group and senior editor at AutoFin Journal and Subprime Auto Finance News. In today's webinar, prepare for a new kind of recovery post-COVID-19. We're going to learn more from a cast of experts orchestrated and led by DRN Executive Vice President and General Manager of FinTech, Jeremiah Wheeler. But before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. Please make sure you've dialed in using the phone number provided in your communication email, or you're able to listen via your PC speakers. We are recording today's webinar and we'll make the recording available to you as soon as possible. You will be in listen-only mode for this webinar, but we will reserve some time after the presentation for a Q&A segment. You could submit your questions at any time to the questions box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And if we aren't able to get to your question today, don't worry, because we'll forward it on to the team at DRN and our other cast of experts so they can respond directly via email. And lastly, if you have any difficulty during today's webinar, please click on the hand icon to alert a member of our team. So with plenty of knowledge to share, let's get right to it. Jeremiah, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Nick, and uh, thanks for uh, Cherokee Media for, for having us today and, and presenting this webinar on our behalf. Uh, we really appreciate it. And first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar and thank everyone for attending and also hope that everyone on the, on the call is doing well um, and healthy and your loved ones are also healthy during this time. I think we're in a we're in a, in a crazy time in all of our lives and in our businesses. And so, you know, the purpose of today's webinar is to just spend some time kind of going over some items, some ideas, some resources, some information from some experts in their, uh, in their field. And, you know, I invited some folks to, uh, to join us today because I think that they will be able to provide some much needed insight into um, both the state and federal regulatory uh, items that are going on out there related to some of the stimulus bills uh, and some of the items that are getting um, put into those bills related to specifically to our, our industry in collections and recovery. And so um, I wanna thank Jan Steger from the Re Receivables Management Association International for joining us today. And I also want to thank uh, Dean Barrett from Landmark Credit Union, as well as Rod Aarons from Southeast Toyota Finance for joining us. And so quickly, I will go through kind of the, the agenda in no particular order. Uh, we will have some lender discussions. We'll have the update from Jan um, from the RMA, and then we will have some user stories that I plan to cover kind of throughout um, looking at those as more of some ideas um, related to other customers of ours that have used uh, vehicle location intelligence in ways that could help your organizations. Um, we're really just trying to provide ideas and thinking outside of the box, uh, both you know pre-COVID, during the, the uh, pandemic, as well as after the pandemic. And obviously, we're here to be a resource for your organization. And then we will open it up, like Nick said, at the end for uh, questions and answers. And so without further ado, <clears throat> I'm gonna turn it over to Jan Steger. And Jan, if you would, just let me know when you're ready to advance slides and we can go ahead and start, start going through these that you're uh, going to share for everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jeremiah. And thank you, um, it's a, pr a pr privilege to be here this morning with you on this. Um, on this webinar, it truly is strange times. Um, we, um, from RMAI's perspective, we had our annual conference in February and would have had no idea. It was just sort of the rumblings of COVID at that time, but I'm sure just everybody else, no, no way to predict what unfolded in the in the last um, two months. Um, so from so RMAI is um, the trade association that we have 550 company members who represent the accounts receivable management industry. 
Um, while we do in, um, represent the entire industry, um, collection agencies, law firms, debt buyers, originating creditors, et cetera, um, our focal point and our um, our focal point is the debt purchasers and sellers um, in the world. But um, having said that, um, most and I would say actually all of what has come out post COVID um, in has it really affects the entire debt collection industry. So um, I wanted to um, start, Jeremiah, if you can advance the slide. There you go. Um, I wanted to start with where we started back in the beginning of March um, and looking at what we needed to do as an industry to respond to the hardships being that were unfolding literally daily um, um, and how we would and how we, how we should respond and what guidance we should provide our members. So, as a background, our members already had in place um, hardship, hardship policies, and those policies generally were um, more geared towards nat nat natural disasters, and we saw, and so they were, you know, never anticipated for the entire nation to go down. Um, they were also geared to what we call personal recessions. So something happening to a consumer um, that um, um, prevented them from fulfilling their, um, you know, their con contractual obligations. Because as we know, uh, most consumers, the vast, vast majority of consumers go into purchasing, do not take out credit or um, accept, um, take, ex um, don't take credit out and, we, and not intend to pay it back. So what we went back at, to look at was how can we advise our members how to enhance those um, policies. And, so our first um, guidance was to really take a take a liberal definition of of what hardship is, and um, to recognize that hardship in co in the COVID environment in, might look very different than hardship previously. So um, we asked our members to listen very closely to consumers on their um, what they're saying. Do they, do their child at that point, you know, did their school close? Now they have a child at home and they have to pay for childcare or find childcare because at that point their work had not closed or maybe they're an essential employee and, um, or maybe they had to take care of a, um, someone who was dealing with COVID or not maybe even symptomatic of COVID, but just, was having to self quarantine and the disruptions that that might have in their household. So we asked them to take a very close look. Um, I mean, to take a very close look and listen very carefully to what the consumer was telling them. It may not just be, hey, I lost my job. I mean, it, it could be much more complicated that. Um, we asked, um, we asked them to be very liberal in temporarily or permanently suspending collection activities um, when they when a consumer shared that they were going through some kind of a financial hardship. And then, as you may know, the FDCPA, which is the governing of the primary federal governing law of the industry, um, requires written um, consumer requests. Um, and, and in the form of if they want to dispute an account or if they're asking for a cease and desist. And we asked them to um, enhance their policy by accepting those requests um, in oral form because we find that that would probably be easier for the consumer. Um, we asked them to be very careful um, while they currently they generally they, they don't um, access social security funds or other supplemental income. Just make sure that they were not, uh, they had things in place to make sure that they were not taking those that income from consumers or not asking consumers to use that income to repay a debt. Um, we asked for a lot of, um, we asked them to place hold, um, place collection holds on consumers um, and um, Maybe, um, maybe and not just the um, account that they were speaking about. Many, many of our members um, 
have um, account, a consumer may have multiple accounts with them. So to assist the consumer to say that, okay, if you're having a problem with this issue or we understand your issue with this account, we're going to make that cover all accounts. Um, and so they don't have to do an account by account basis. And then um, be generous with extending, extending grace periods, balance reductions, you know, um, suspending the accrual of interest during this time and things like that. And so our members actually um, responded very well to that. And um, I, I believe that the industry has been a good corporate partner in um, the in this whole pandemic and national emergency. Before I go on to the next slide, I wanted to note to you um, on the bottom um, corner of your this slide is a resource page that RMA I has on our on our front on our home page and it is a um, it's open to everyone. It's not member protected and I would encourage you um, to to go to look at it. Um, it's actually updated daily um, with whatever is coming out and all these and things come out every single day. But a couple of times I'll probably reference reference that page. Um, and so um, be sure that you take a note of it. So to start with on that page, at the top of that page, we have guidance to our members and it has a whole bunch of different member alerts that were sent out. But one of them is guidance and it starts with um, it serves, it's sort of a growing document and starts starts with the um, enhanced hardship policies that were, which were the first things that we rolled out. Um, okay, Jeremy, you can go to the next slide. All right. So as we were going through, so as we um, <clears throat> as we dealt with um, non legal collections, we were seeing a greater and greater. Um, pressure and hearing from most state regulators on um, legal collections. And in addition to that, there were a lot of courts closing and things and um, courts closing down or limiting um, operations to emergency procedures or emergency items. And so our next step was to advise our members of how we expected or how we would advise them to handle um, the handle, handle legal collections. So just right off the front is that to suspend any new judgment executions, garnishments, or other post-judgment activities, we certainly didn't want um, any, um, you know, consumer to get hit with any kinds of um, financial, financial, um, we, we certainly didn't want the consumer to have their first garnishment or their first bank loan or something during, during this time. So those were all put on hold. Um, and then to honor forbearance for existing judgments until normal court functions resume. Um, that, so those, those were very important to us. And then the third really is sort of just a generic comment that you have to literally watch every day not only at the state courts, but even local just local courts of, of what 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 is going on with them. A lot for a while, there was a lot of courts actually still accepting um, filings um, and then just not doing anything with them. But um, but um, I, we're seeing that um, kind of clamp down a little bit more and then suspending any existing foreclosures. Obviously, this is not the time that we're going to be um, going on and um, um, you know, removing property or enforcing um, property liens or things like that. So um, we, um, so the, that was our legal advice to our members. I think right. You can go forward, Jeremy. So actually, I think I titled this one wrong versus a court related activity. So really this slide is, and it literally changes daily. Um, it um, it talks about it, it really references in which states um, there has been either emergency orders or executive orders, a legislation passed that has in some way um, restricted the debt collection. Um, here again, I will go back to referencing our resource page and we have a new um, 
a new um, link on there. We have every state on there, so you can go in and see what has come out in every state. But we also got permission from StateNet, which is the organization that we track all of our federal, state and federal activities on um, to link their website. And theirs is very comprehensive. You can roll, scroll, roll over the state and it will take you to all the different um, links that are pertinent to that state for this. So I would encourage that. So that is a great resource and that and they maintain that. So that was really good. So we have seen over the last three weeks, four weeks now, just it, the it just runs the gamut on what different states are doing. We have had some states that we've heard, well, just business as usual, which is just so odd um, for us to hear. I'm based in California. A lot of my folks are in New York, and maybe it's because our states are pretty heavily hit and our activities are fairly are very restricted that it's hard to even imagine what business as usual actually means. But um, but what we have seen, um, it ranges from in New York, ceasing the collection of government debt, medical debt, and student and government backed student loans. We've seen that actually that that's at the federal level as well. So that has been probably one of the more common um, restrictions that we have seen um, for our members. Um, it's not. Um, it's not. It, it doesn't. It, it doesn't affect our our members as much as um, some other members. Um, the places where we have seen, um, and then in other states, we've seen more restrictive things. We've seen um, restrictions on outbound calls. Um, I think it comes to mind Massachusetts and. Um, they they limit how many that they actually don't want you making any outbound calls and so probably predictable these emergency orders and emergency um, executive orders and things coming out of the AG's offices and the various um, departments of financial services. Um, they're hastily written and so it's not clear to us. Um, it is often not clear exactly what what practices are acceptable and what are not. So we are frequently going back to the regulators and asking for frequently asked questions to be answered and then posting those as well. And so while we while we um, understand that, um, you know, placing outbound calls on new accounts is probably um, a little bit um, too much at this point. Um, we we are often battling or asking that we can make outbound calls to consumers who are currently on payment plans and uh, or things like that, and making sure that they're okay and actually offering to um, reduce those payment plans amounts or extend the payments or stall them or put a pause on their actions or something. But to be able to assess. To the, the consumer to find out what was going on. In some states, we actually were was bans on actually on incoming calls as well. And in that one, Nevada actually completely banned collections in inbound and outbound calls. And what are the problems with the inbound calls? Because we have a lot of we had a lot of consumers actually trying to reach reach their debt collector to make arrangements or to um, to let them know their situation, but some of them were needed to make a payment on um, in order to clear something up. So maybe they were going out to purchase a car, or maybe they were refinancing their house because interest rates are dropping, or something like that, and they had a collection activity that needed to be cleaned up. And so it was really um, we've been somewhat actually fairly successful on, on um, promoting that, that um, inbound, that amount that um, consumers need to be able to call their debt collector um, and have a conversation with them. That, that has been a little bit more, um, we've been a little more successful there. Um, we, um, the federal government now is just coming out with ceasing collections on federal veterans debt owed to the government. And um, we have seen some restrictions on credit reporting. And that's another area that we've had to 
really sort of work with um, work with the regulators because the way they word that is that they can't you cannot um, um, report anything negative to credit. Well, by definition, um, we are furnishers, and what we furnish is actually negative. And so there was a while where they couldn't even our members couldn't even tell the credit reporting agencies that they, the consumer had made a payment. So they were actually harming a consumer more. Um, they, um, like I said, Nevada was probably the most extreme in, um, in just completely banning collections at all. Um, there have been states that have said that financial services are um, essential services and um, for a while, um, they were including debt collectors in there. We're now seeing orders that say that debt collection indus industry is not an essential service. And so, um, in those states, that the, that there are, um, they have had to um, to cease. I mean, they've had to not cl to close their offices. We've seen several several um, of our members go to remote collections, which as you can imagine is challenging um, with the amount of personal um, information that goes with a, um, that, that goes with each account for a collector working from home and um, the security and privacy needed. Um, additionally, so we have requested that our members actually increase call monitoring so that their collector that they have a, a closer watch on the, the conversations that the collectors are having. Um, Wisconsin, like I say, this changes absolutely every day. And yesterday, Wisconsin came out with a, um, I don't know how many of you saw it, with emergency guidance. And this is the kind of guidance that is fairly vague. And I'll just read you this one sentence from it. <clears throat> Debt collectors who routinely rely on telephone calls as a debt collection tactic should be forewarned. Whether conduct can reasonably be expected to threaten or harass a consumer depends on the context, and the worldwide context just shifted dramatically. Practices that may have been typical or customary under normal conditions may be deemed harassment under conditions of a global pandemic. So that that is. Um, not real helpful to us. I mean, it's it doesn't tell you what you can and can't do. It just tells you to be on notice. So those uh, we try not to. Um, we, we try to work with regulators to get more clarity than something like that. NACARA, which is the uh, the agency that is represents the so the collection licensing boards in various states. They came out with very reasonable guidance and just said, you know, don't stop communicating um, with the consumers and encouraging states not to continue to, I mean, not to ban communication because the very worst thing that can happen is that you would have consumers um, that you stop talking to a consumer. So um, then um, New Jersey, so just another example of who knows what's going on every day. New Jersey um, on Friday um, had some emergency legislation out and they were going to um, prohibit um, or ban debt collection. And theirs was specific, I mean, especially egregious in that it was going to last from the time that the um, emergency, national emergency, or actually in time, the time when the governor declared that the emergency o was over, um, plus 120 days post. So essentially, you would have, they would have been put, um, debt collection um, would not have been able to happen in the, in, for New Jersey residents um, for, you know, four months after this ended. And that would, that would be very, very harmful. Thankfully, that bill actually, we got some, we had some amendments and um, were, and that bill ended up not coming off the floor. They're now out of session for a couple of weeks. And personally, my hope is that in the next few weeks, we see, for so many reasons, this um, pandemic, um, have had, you know be past the peak of it and being on the downside and hopefully there won't there there won't there won't there won't be this need or this perceived need to to produce further regulations. Yep, um, I agree with you, Jan. 
for sure. We've been watching uh, a similar bills that have that are floating around with uh, very similar stipulations, uh, particularly that 120 day post pandemic uh, piece yeah. is very worrisome for everyone in our industry. So, um, <laughs> but yes, we can keep going. I can flip to the next one if you'd like. Yeah, and this one I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, it. Um, as the courts closed down and the courts limited activities um, in several states, 19 states um, and counting, the, um, they have told the statute of limitations, which is very helpful for our members because um, it, it, it maintains the value of the accounts that, um, be, um, because if the statute were to run during this time period, then those accounts, um, they, would le they would lose the legal avenue um, in their toolbox for collections. And um, right now, our challenge in um, tolling statutes is that the courts came out with them or come out with them, and it's not always, they don't always jive or match up with what the executive order is. So it might say we're going to toll the statute to a specific date, and but then they, you know, the, the courts are, the, um, na the national emergency or the state emergency is, is carries on longer than that. And so we're trying to work to marry those two dates. Those dates should match that when the courts reopen and when the when collections can, can you know can can carry on, then um, then that should be the date, the end date for the tolling of the statute. So so far so well, so good. And those again are on the resource page, and they're updated. Literally, they they come out every couple of days. Another state comes out and says that they will toll the statute, which is very helpful for us. Um, and then I'll just go on to my final slide to talk a little bit about what's going on the on the federal level. Um, you can see um, the um, the top three were the are the ones that were. Um, I'm not sure that that's the right language, but that's okay. Um, so what we have seen on the federal level is you guys are all familiar, I'm sure, with phase one, phase two, phase three. And so far, those have been really geared to financial um, or federal, you know, um, stimulus packages and, and making sure the economy is going on. What we do see for phase four is a um, is a desire to get more, put more um, what I would call behavioral and conduct items into those into um, into the package so it's no not really just a stimulus package and you might have seen um, legislation out there by um, the House Democrats and um, Senator Brown um, that are very you know essentially banned debt collection um, and put a lot of other restrictions on um, the industry. In, in, in as well as, as credit reporting, and um, we view those, we call those messaging bills. Um, we don't expect that they will get into any any federal bill, or um, and that they, mainly because the Senate is controlled by the Republicans, that we don't think they will get in there. We keep a very close eye on monitoring them, but we try to be. Um, but we, um, but anyway, but but they're very, they catch a lot of heads headlines. They're very sensational, but um, they would be absolutely devastating if you had a federal um, closing down of the industry. So far, we don't think that they have any legs, but we, but we are monitoring. Um, yeah. And Jan, I can help you out a little bit there. As to my apologies for that misprint there on that slide five. Um, but the uh, the notes here, the meetings with the CFPB um, that you guys have had to discuss uh, items, as well as the letters to the Trump administration and the House Financial Services Committee. Right. Yeah. So let me just say that those. Um, so we've been active, obviously, sending letters to HFS and Senate Banking and to the administration talking about the need that how devastating it would be to close down the industry and actually the unintended consequences of closing down the industry. 
Um, yesterday, we sent a letter to um, Treasury um, Secretary Mnuchin um, supporting um, some proposals out there that um, the, that the Treasury actually earmarks the federal stimulus funds that are coming out, the $1,200 um, payments that are coming out to consumers and to make, to make them not eligible for um, debt collection. So we, again, issued um, advice to our members yesterday that they should not, in their collection e efforts, they should not be seeking or encouraging a consumer to utilize those funds to, um, for, um, for existing debt. And we have um, asked that, um, the, you know, that banks, that, they, that the Treasury has a way to identify those funds and so that when they hit the banks, the banks can earmark them and that they wouldn't be eligible for bank loans. So um, industry does not intend and recognizes that the proper use of those funds is to help our consumers um, get through this very tough time and that and then so we don't want to be out there trying to utilize those funds. Um, so the other item that he that Jeremiah mentioned is our work with the CFPB. We've had several calls with them, and part of them are, you know, what can the industry can do, or what challenges are we face, facing, and things like that. And one of the face, the issues that we do face is that the FDCPA is a strict liability statute, and our and the members and the debt collectors, just like the good actors in your industry are doing their very best to keep up with these um, emergency um, legislation, the executive orders. I mean, there are executive orders that are passed at five o'clock one day and they go into effect the next morning at 8 a.m. And we have a, we are looking for some potential um, regulatory relief that, you know, in a year or in eight months when this is, this hopefully has passed, that you know we our members have some protection from being sued of violating the FDCPA because they violated an executive order. So we are trying to work with um, we're working with the CFPB on understanding the situation that you're putting our members in. Um, so I think that kind of covers it for me. And, all right well thank you Jan. and so what we'll do is uh we we have gotten a few questions for you so far um one of them specifically is related to nevada so maybe uh at the end here we'll we'll circle back around and if if we're able to answer those on the call then that would be great if not we're more than happy to to communicate via email post uh webinar and and try to help you guys get those answers that you're that you're looking for so um Basically, we'll we'll go ahead and keep going here because I know we have some other items to share. And then if you do have any questions, please submit those through the chat function. Nick will begin uh, towards the end there when we open up for questions. He'll start asking those to myself as well as Jan and, and Rod and Dean. So, um, so I just wanted to put this placeholder here in the slide previous to this was just kind of giving everyone out there an idea of how many cars are really on the road. And, you know, we as a company are trying to collect as much location intelligence as possible for all of our customers, whether it be, you know, lenders, um, collection agencies, et cetera, to help you guys paint a better picture for uh, the risk that you're exposed to, where your customers are, where your assets are, and, and uh, you know, what the best process to put in place to help find those assets are. Um, <clears throat> we're currently, you know, uh, on a, on pace every month, month over month, to do about 160, 170 million scans a month, and that really does create a good opportunity for lenders and creditors to use our data earlier in cycle. Um, this case study was uh, put together by us in AmeriDrive, um, which is uh, they use GPSs on majority of their cars, but obviously we all know that you know, the lenders out there that do use GPS devices typically will have a, you know, some rate of failure or some rate of disconnect. Um, and that's where, you know, this uh, LPR data comes in handy, uh, working with recovery agencies out there to 
be sure that they can pick their cars up faster. Um, and overall, it drives a lower cost associated to OPEX internally. I mean, we've seen uh, a number of lenders, um, Rod, Aaron's on the phone too, he, he'll, you know, he'll vouch for this. They've seen a, a lower OPEX internally by using the data earlier in cycle to help mitigate the risk later on down the road. Um, Ameridrive was able to was able to increase recoveries and they were able to decrease the charge offs that they were seeing by using the vehicle location data. Um, and like Daniel Rice says over there, it's about experience, speed and service. Uh, and that's why they're sticking with DRN and using us earlier and earlier in cycle. So really, I mean, you know, we have a saying at DRN that, you know, we talk about wear data all the time and, you know, there's a number of different, different institutions out there that are that are gathering and capturing wear data our our wear data is obviously vehicle location data and it can be used to help communicate with your customers to help map out um, different strategies in collections and in recovery but most importantly to identify where your customers are versus where you think they are so since the uh, pandemic started uh, you know, more U.S. centered pandemic and we got the national state of emergency and everyone kind of started putting the moratoriums on repossessions in place. We have been working with a number of our customers and lenders to do analysis of their portfolios to see where their customers are uh, migrating. So typically, you know, when we have life events, uh, especially in the lending and collections community, you'll see that customers that are typically transient and they move around a lot, they will continue that same pattern. Um, but customers that are not typically transient, um, they in most cases would have to have a, a severe life event happen before they would start moving around. Well, obviously, uh, you know, with the pandemic, we've all had severe life events happen here, you know, in the last month or so um, with the shutdown of the economy. And so, you know, our one of our lenders was really interested in seeing, you know, where are my assets, where are my customers versus where we think they are. And only looking at residential addresses, looking at, you know, the the uh, the places in which the customers were located or where the lender thinks they're located. And so we've we've been putting together some analysis there. So it's just a thought to think about, you know, if you're one of our existing customers or you're a customer that wants to analyze your portfolio just on a one-off basis, we're more than happy to help you guys do that. Uh, we obviously want to be a resource uh, in, in these times to help you get through the, the process. Um, this next case study was Westlake Financial. Uh, they were able to severely uh, decrease their charge-offs and OPEX around the recovery collections activities that kind of go from one bucket to the next bucket and um, that that flow over we were able to decrease there significantly uh, days to repo was decreased and um, we know that Westlake still puts out a number of cars for repossession on a monthly basis but um, using data and analytics earlier in cycle and having it tied into uh, through an API into their actual uh, platform that they service their customers with, they were able to get some analytics built into there to say, you know what, our customer is kind of red flagging because they're they're 500 miles away from the given address we have on file um, and they're there for more than the last three months. So we might need to, you know, make a phone call and see if we can see if we can find these um, these people and, and at least stay in contact with them and ask them if we need to update their address or send them new information, et cetera. So um, so basically, you know, just like Jan was saying earlier, you know, it's really important to pay attention to the debt collection rules and regulations on the state and federal level, but also, you know, helping yourself prepare for risks as, uh, as it's associated to your assets, as it's associated to the laws and regulations out there. Um, you know, it's really important to do that. So I wanted to go ahead and bring Rod on the line and you know, let's chat a little bit with Rod Aarons from Southeast Toyota Finance about kind of what the what they're seeing, how they're how they're dealing with the the COVID, pre-COVID, post-COVID, kind of what their plans are. Um, Rod, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Jeremiah. I appreciate that uh, introduction. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk through some of the points here. Uh, you'll hear a little bit of uh, repetitiveness to what Jeremiah talked about, but I can talk about specifically kind of how we've used uh, DRN data in the past and again, kind of what, what we see today and, and maybe a little bit about what we see in the future uh, given the, the current situation that we're in. But really there's three sort of avenues that we've pursued in our relationship with DRN. The, the first one I'll touch on is real time uh, repossession. That kind of goes without saying you've got your the numbers out there on a hot list, so to speak, and, and your OICs and the camera cars have those lists. And if they spot a plate, it automatically alerts them and they can uh, affect uh, real-time repossession. Uh, the second avenue that we approached was really leveraging that historical data, all those hits that um, Jeremiah was speaking of, that vast amount of, you know, just this pile of hits. And what intrigued us about that is I may not be looking for that car today that uh, DRN is collecting data and hits on, but three or four months from now, I may want to know exactly where that car is. And even if I can't find it then in real time, at least I know where it was and it aids me in my skip trace and uh, recovery efforts. But um, so we wanted to prove this is probably three or four years ago now, but we wanted to really look at the value of that data and what, how we chose to measure it was uh, look at our 60 day volume of accounts in our 60 to 90 day bucket and then lag that two months and look at how many of that, you know, volume wise or percent of that bucket, how much rolled to a full balance charge off or a skip charge off. So we measured that over time, uh, kind of established our baseline uh, expectation. Um, and then we used that to measure it. Once we started utilizing that historical data, we had that same measure to go back and say, here's what my expected uh, roll rate from 60 to 90 day bucket rolling to full balance charge off. Here's where it was uh, in actuality using the DRN historical data. Um, and there was a there was a decent drop there and that really completely justified uh, the use of that data and showed that there was value uh, there uh, in that data. And, and uh, to this day, we, we continue to use that historical data in that fashion. Um, and then we also look at it from an account treatment um, perspective, and that's really our third avenue we look at. Uh, we give our late stage collectors uh, who are working those accounts before they'll necessarily be put out for repossession. Um, we give them access to the historical data uh, to be able to go in and, and look at that and you know determine uh, maybe I can't get a hold of a customer today. I look at the DRN data. I see that his plate is spotted all around his home address. We know exactly where the collateral is. I could probably wait a bit longer and work that account a little bit harder on the phone because I know I can pretty much grab my collateral whenever I want it, right? Um, as opposed to the person who, you know, the example that um, Jeremiah just referred to, you look up real-time hits or historical hits and it's showing two states away, the guy's past due, not returning phone calls, I'm probably going to accelerate my repo. Uh, repossession decision a little bit uh, more urgently on an account like that. So those are really the three avenues that um, we use the uh, DRN data um, today. Um, great results, uh, all three of those avenues, um, great results uh, uh, that we're achieving on the uh, on the portfolio. Uh, second, Thanks for that, like Ryan. Um, oh, oh, sure, go well, ahead. I was just going to add to that. Um, so you know, I know that we've seen, you know, Rod and, and team have been very, very helpful in helping us develop new ideas around how lenders want to see, you know, data and products come out of DRN. And obviously we want to be a resource. And so that's kind of the purpose of, of me bringing Rod on the call because Rod has a, a ton of really good ideas and is always a good resource for us to kind of lean on and 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 uh, Rod, one one other question I think is really you know the middle middle point here on the slide is how have you sure. seen the collections you know your collection shop change um, and what are you guys doing a little bit differently besides you know the work from home orders and things of that nature how are you guys adapting to to that and then lastly what what do you guys see coming in the future in terms of the moratorium release are you guys kind of eyeballing a certain time period or you just kind of roll in every 10 days, 15 days? How are you guys managing that? Right, right. Um, starting with kind of how collections have changed, I mean, you know, it's all about extension volume for us. And so we've probably processed, well, not probably, I know we have, we've processed more one or two month extensions on our portfolio in the last, 
uh, gosh, almost up on a month now. I think it started mid-March. Um, processed more extensions on our portfolio than we typically would do in an entire year. So, um, and w- but I, we are always cognizant we don't want to get lulled into a false sense of security because we haven't seen our early stage delinquency really move a lot off of our expectations prior to um, COVID-19. But we know that all that extension activity is is sort of clouding that that picture. We know it would be much worse. Um, so th- so that's what that's the biggest change. I mean that and the repo moratorium. Uh, we have that in effect. We have no uh, involuntary repossessions. We will continue to pick up uh, a voluntary if a customer calls us and wants to turn in a vehicle, uh, or if there's a lien or an impound or a situation that our collateral is in jeopardy. We'll we'll continue to pursue those. But um, those are the two biggest changes. And I. I think um, some of the other things we're looking at, one of the things we, we realized we didn't, weren't planning on it, but it makes sense after the fact, is we have a significant increase in our uh, outbound connect rate. And we frankly were a little bit shocked by that. But then when you think about it, everybody's sheltering in place pretty much. So they're obviously going to be uh, home more. Uh, but we, we did have a significant increase in our connect rate and collections that allowed us uh, to really be able to redeploy some of our associates into customer care who was getting just a significant deluge of inbound calls, uh, high abandon rates, a uh, whole lot going on there. And that, that continues to this day. But, you know, it's a lot of people who, you know, frankly, want to want to talk about their account and what their options are. So um, um, we're happy to do that. But that's certainly some of the changes uh, we've we've been dealing with. Uh, as well as on the call monitoring side with, you know, we have speech analytics installed as well. And one thing that, that the speech analytics platform will do for us is it gives us a measure of empathy on the call. Um, I've never been completely convinced that that's completely accurate, but I'm glad we have it um, at this point. Because, um, again, we've got a fully dispersed workforce. They're all working from home. Uh, and that gives us a good way to make sure that, you know, we're we're not, pressing hardcore on the collection side that we are displaying empathy, especially in this time. Um, we're tied to Southeast Toyota distributors, ultimately to Toyota, to the brand. And we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we do whatever we can to protect the brand as we're uh, talking to those customers as well. Um, yeah. But that that's kind of what we've seen change. And then our dialer team, uh, as Jan was talking about with the, re- the changing environment almost by the hour in terms of regulations, we have our dialer team completely plugged in with our legal and compliance team and making sure that we're making any adjustments to our outbound dialer campaigns as, as any regulations change. We always did that in the past, but it wasn't anything like the environment that we're in, uh, that we're in currently. So. Okay. Um, well, I, I would imagine that that speech analytics platform is pretty interesting, especially being that you have so many remote employees now. It's, I mean, you would have to, you would have to literally listen to hours and hours of conversation to to see if that right. level of empathy is there. So I, I would imagine yeah. that that's a, a really helpful tool that you guys have added uh, in the past. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I guess, you know, this next slide, connect to collect. I mean, it's not just right now, it's not about collecting dollars. I mean, it's about collecting information and collecting, like you said, the the level of empathy and concern and care that we have for the customers out there and you know obviously our data can be used for helping to connect to that customer not just to collect the dollars or collect the asset but to connect to the customer to to try to provide that level of information because in a lot of cases even pre-COVID-19 I mean you know a lot of customers are not aware of the options that they have with the lender Um, they're not aware of the um, loan modification options that they have. They're not aware of a lot of things and they'll just avoid that phone call over and over and over until a point where you have no choice but to to repossess the asset and you have no choice but to ask for a full balance payoff or, or nothing at all after you know it charges off. So there's a lot of there's a lot of options and, and means out there for uh, connecting to collect. There's a lot of information that's needed and uh, it sounds like you guys are doing a really good job of that. Um, so <clears throat> next, I want to bring in Dean Barrett from uh, Landmark Credit Union. Dean heads up the collection efforts over there for that for their shop. And so, Dean, thanks for being with us today. Um, you know, I know we have some similar points here that we wanted to talk to you about as we talk to Rod about. And you know, feel free to to go ahead and start whenever you're ready. 
Thanks, Jeremiah. I appreciate it. Um, so Rod hit on a lot of the key details, so I'll try not to repeat the whole heck of a lot of them. Um, you know, one thing relative to, you know, we use um, the data uh, very similar to Rod, right? So we're looking for those clusters and we're looking for those uh, where is the collateral and same same type of philosophy. We know that where the collateral is, uh, we can spend a little more time looking for accounts. Um, I'll just touch on some, I guess, realistic stories that we had and really how it helps us is um, being a, a credit union, um, not a federal credit union, a, a state chartered credit union, which goes by zip codes. Um, you know, a high percentage of our collateral is in southeastern Wisconsin, northern Illinois. However, we all know there are uh, people who either move and or have bad intentions. So um, one of the best stories I could share is that um, when we put a vehicle out for repossession, it's last known address unless we have obviously some other intel. And so that's usually southeastern Wisconsin or northern Illinois. And we were looking for a high-end car. This was shortly after uh, we went live um, with the data. And uh, boy, I, t I gotta tell you, um, we, st we started getting a hit at, a, at an airport in South Carolina. And this is about an 80, $80 $90,000 vehicle. And, you know, we had originally put it out to the last known address, which was in northern Illinois. And um, once we started getting the live hits, uh, we were able to contact the airport. They actually allowed our vendor to uh, they open the gate to actually get the car. So um, that's one of the success stories. So using the data, using the clusters, using the intel, um, it saves you a lot of time and effort. Um, when you're looking for stuff in Wisconsin, but they're now in California, they're now in Carolina, they're down in Florida, wherever the case might be. Yeah, um, yeah, we see that a lot for sure. And, and you know, uh, that story comes up a lot too in, in different conversations. I know it was a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good story for you guys and a pretty good result. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the pandemic and the virus, how are you guys handling your collections now and then what do you see kind of how rod touched on some of those other points like are you guys doing anything majorly different than you were besides working from home and, and things of that nature and how are you guys planning to come out out of this once some of these states of emergency and even the national emergency is lifted how are you guys kind of planning on coming out of that and then after you answer those two we will We'll probably open it up for Q and A. Uh, we have about eight eight minutes left in our in our webinar, but we're not restricted to one hour. We can go over slightly if we will if we want to. But uh, I wanted to just try to keep everybody um, on time in terms of respecting everyone's time that's still on the call. So go ahead, uh, Dean. Thanks, Jeremiah. I'll be real. I'll be real brief. Um, you know, we're in Wisconsin, Janet mentioned, so some language came out yesterday. I mean, basically, we turned into a loss mitigation shop overnight. So yeah. I have a staff of about 40 people. Um, outbound calls, dialer calls, all suspended basically overnight. We have basically set up in our deferral extension, um, call it our relief program. Um, we've de we decided we're going to do a three-month relief on payments on all products. Um, right out of the gate. So uh, home equity lines of credit are getting re-aged, credit card payments are getting skipped, uh, auto loans are getting three-month deferrals. They are upon request. We didn't do it across the board for every loan. Um, so we've been handling those requests for nearly a month now. So we've had well over 4,000 requests come in. We divided our team. There's 10 people making phone calls on the request. There's 10 people pro getting documents out. There's 10 people receiving and processing them in the system. I mean, we basically just turned into a loss mitigation um, shop uh, through this difficult time. As we come out of this, we'll ha and that volume slows down, and the volume has started to slow down here in the last week, we're doing about half of where we were off our peak. So. Um, as we come out of this, we will have to, you know, get everybody obviously acclimated to uh, the collections piece again. The good news is, is um, you know, when it comes to 
like repossessions, um, the data's out there. It's it's in your database. Um, the D, um, the DRN uh, database, RDN databases. So um, the accounts are still being monitored. Um, as soon as we're ready to go, um, yeah, it's going to take us time to catch up just to, due to a sheer volume. Um, yeah. But we will have the data there, so that will help us recover quicker than um, if we didn't have that data available. So that's kind of how we're handling yeah. it. I don't have everybody working from home. I have uh, I have about half my team working from home. I have the other half scattered out through about four different locations. Uh, we used to all be in the same location, so it's been very difficult um, to try to train and, and keep everyone connected, but uh, we've done a real good job um, trying to do that and stay up with that. I mean, I would never say it's perfect. It's been it's been a challenge for sure, um, but we're looking forward to uh, life back to normal at some point. Yes, absolutely. I think we all are for sure, and, you know, thanks for providing all that information and uh, thanks for uh, for answering those questions. I think there was a lot of helpful information we gathered out of out of you and Rod there. So um, our last quick case study was Philadelphia Federal Credit Union. Um, <clears throat> they were just in a two in a one month period. They were able to cure 11 loans and repossess two vehicles that they could not find, which resulted in about a hundred and fifty thousand dollar potential loss savings. So. Uh, similar to your story, Dean, you know, I think it's really important to use the data earlier and earlier in cycle and obviously analyze your portfolio regularly, not just for location, but also for bankruptcy alerts, for, you know, impound alerts, export, things of that nature. I mean, anything that you can monitor your, uh, for your portfolio for is, is absolutely essential. Um, so now I want to, I want to open it up for, for questions. Um, and we'll try to provide some answers. I know that Nevada question that one of our uh, audience members had earlier, uh, Jan did provide that link. So we'll be sure and get that information over to you specific to Nevada. Um, Nick, are there any other questions at this time that we, that we can answer? Absolutely. And thanks you to, to each one of you for, for participating today. And just a a quick reminder that we are recording today's uh, webinar, so keep watch of your inbox for a link to the recording of, of this session uh, arriving as soon as possible. You see, you can review the, the great information that's been shared as well as uh, distributed out uh, among your other uh, participants and, and coworkers at your shop. Just to um, circle back to, to you, Jan, uh, again, you, you did a wonderful job articulating the uh, on a state and, and federal level, but what what are your instant instincts telling you about what the the best case scenario, the worst case scenario might be as far as when uh, recovery activities might be able to resume? What type of restrictions on collections are are happening? Uh, how long moratoriums might last? But as best as you can, what what are your instincts telling you about uh, the best case scenario and and perhaps the worst that that a finance company should brace for? Sure, so um, thank you for the question. Um, let me start with the worst case because I'd rather end on good news than bad news. Um, I think the worst case scenario would could be that um, we see more and more emergency orders um, out there that prohibit the um, debt collection activity for extended periods past when the um, the, the national emergency is over. And one of our concerns there is that um, while, you know, the president may end the national emergency, <clears throat> the governors, um, as you know, and was controversial the last couple of days, um, will control the states. And so many of these emergency rec um, orders are written as, you know, that the these restrictions you know cease to apply when the governor de declares the national the state emergency over or 90 days pass or 30 days pass or something like that there could be incentives for the governors to not actually formally end their national their state emergencies because 
when the state is in a declared emergency, they're, you know, um, they have access to some special funding and their um, residents have um, access to special funding, whether it's from FEMA or other organizations. So a bit of concern on when these will um, actually um, end, these restrictions. Um, Probably another concern more macroeconomics is that this becomes more of a valley and a recession and a long term, um, it, um, you know, long, a long road to recovery versus a V-shaped um, recession that we're all sort of hoping for at this point in time. And then probably the other worst case is the concern that some of the um, executive orders um, could gain, gain some momentum and become permanent rules. Um, as you know, we have a lot of consumer advocates out there who um, will be promoting the, um, the sort of the trans, transforming these um, restrictions into permanent law. On the brighter side, I am thinking, I, I think that um, a, v a V curve um, would be very helpful for the um, economy and for the industry. Optimistically, I would hope that um, the industry has been um, viewed as a good corporate partner um, during this um, pandemic and that maybe our reputation and um, we'll, we'll see an improvement. I mean, we always battle that, um, what people think of us. Um, I would say that for my debt purchasing members, um, we have, we are beginning to see, and I think we may continue to see increased volume coming out from lenders um, and creditors because it's a way to get immediate liquidity back into their business. And so we may see more portfolios coming to market. And then I guess I would also hope that um, some of the technology that has been uh, that that has been implemented and been um, enabled with, um, during this pandemic continues. I think the enhanced use of um, you know emails and text messages and maybe some of the virtual um, or remote work will actually. Um, and that we can see that those are um, tools that we use going forward. All right. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Appreciate that. Excellent. Excellent. And, and we'll, we'll round out our, our, our time today with, with you, Jeremiah. We'll, we'll give you the, the closing uh, parting shots here. Uh, just, again, uh, you shared some of the, the past case studies of, of DRN clients. Uh, maybe perhaps if you could share uh, – what, what some current customers ha have done with the data maybe in the last 15 to, to 30 days of, of using the information to, to perhaps craft some new modeling or some, some new strategies and, and how have you and the team been able to, to, to keep that data robust uh, for your clients? Uh, if you could, just the last word as far as what, what activities have happened in, in your shop in the past 15 to, sure. to 30 some days. Sure. So I think, you know, I touched on it earlier. The the one of the big things from a lending perspective is is just kind of segmenting and bucketing each uh group of customers based on their their moving patterns and basically, you know, looking at where your customers are versus where you think they are is really important to risk. Um you need to, you know, reach out to those customers if they are moving 50, 100 miles away from the addresses you have on file. And that's only to update your information. Obviously, it's not to, you know, um, collect, so to speak, not at this point in time, but that will afford you the ability and opportunity to do so when you need to in the future. And as far as keeping the data flowing and keeping, um, keeping things going in, you know, in the market for our agents and our lenders out there in the community is, you know, we're putting in some scan programs in place uh, with some of our agents where we're trying to keep them on the road and keeping them scanning during this time, even though there are repo moratoriums out there. And so we're just trying to think outside of the box as much as possible and, and keep everyone um, 
keep everyone driving forward out there and keeping the data available to our lenders that are still trusting us to do our jobs and, and keep things flowing. So uh, just want to say thank everybody, you know, thank everyone for joining us and hope you all stay happy, healthy, and uh, we're all going to get through this together. And, you know, we will all see each other on the other side of this. Um, and we will, I think, learn a lot of great things from the resilience of our employees and the resilience of our industry, as well as, you know, lenders and debt collectors and everyone being proactive and self-regulating, I think has been a really big um, positive factor uh, for any governmental body to look at and say, you know, that we do care about the consumer and that we, you know, care about our fellow uh, man. So thanks everybody for joining us and Nick, I'll let you close it out. Very, very well said, Jeremiah. Thank you for, for organizing uh, this educational webinar and, and to each uh, Rod, Jan, and Darren, each of you for, for participating. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us. And for, on behalf of all of us at Cherokee Media Group, uh, please stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to having you again next time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.